Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to our final stimulus advisory board meeting. Again, I am Mayor Tashara Jones. I use the she, her pronouns. I wanted to open with an update on the status of board bill two. The very first point in the uh, stimulus advisory board's mandate under management and oversight was reviewing treasury guidance to make sure funds are in compliance with federal rules. I'm proud to say that SAB members and my administration work hard to keep all of our rec recommendations within federal regulations, consulting with legal and compliance counsel. President Reed did not. Instead, he waited to the last minute to turn in his homework and he attempted to push over $75 million in economic development funds into the direct relief package at the last minute, refusing to take public comment on these additions and shutting down debate at the Board of Aldermen, at the Board of Aldermen before our allies could introduce amendments focused on these provisions. The bill advanced by President Reed could not be approved by myself and the comptroller yesterday because it does not meet regulations set out by US Treasury Department, the US Treasury Department for the use of the American Rescue Plan Act funds. The city councilor agrees with our assessment. Again, this is what happens when you turn in your homework at the last minute. And I can tell you that the people on this call today worked extremely hard to dot all of their I's and cross all of their T's. From the beginning of this process, I have emphasized the urgency of using the American Rescue Plan Act funds and getting vaccines and arms, getting $5 million and $500 payments to St. Louis families and addressing the root cause of crime to improve public safety. People are suffering. And for more than a month, I've been working hard to get the people the relief they need. The mayor's office made numerous attempts to work with President Reed to bring this bill into compliance with treasury rules. He rebuffed us every single time. But I feel confident that we, we will be able to get St. Louisans the relief they need. And I'm proud that the vast majority of the priorities outlined by the SAB and then my proposal made it into board bill two. And I'm especially proud that even after President Reed stripped out $5 million in direct cash assistance from board bill two, we fought hard to get it back in. Clergy, community, le community leaders, labor, and other elected leaders came together in an effort to restore our $500 relief payments. And we did via amendment through the board of aldermen introduced by Alderman John Muhammad. As I've said from the beginning, we knew this would be a political process. Our policies would have to make it through the Board of Aldermen and the Board of Estimate Apportionment. And while yesterday was just a speed bump, we're working to get to make sure our, our policies outlined in Board Bill 2 or another vehicle are enacted. My administration is exploring every option to make sure that we get people vaccinated as soon as possible and get people the relief they need. And with that, I'll turn it over to our co-chairs. Great, thank you, Mayor Jones. Very much appreciated. Uh, Sandy, how are you doing today? I am doing just fine. Good, good. Missing, missing a few cues, but that's okay. I'm ready. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> that's okay. Good morning, every, everyone. Good morning, Mayor. Thank you for those opening comments. Um, as co-chair of the Stimulus Advisory Board, along with Wally, uh, we have the privilege of having sort of the last word today. And it's probably one of the few times in my personal and professional life that I haven't been excited about having the last word. Um, I wish that we were going to continue the conversation, but here we are. This board came together in April. At Sandy, the end of yes. Sandy, I'm yes. really sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure before we make our statement, we are going to get some reports out from the working groups. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So I, yeah. let, let me finish with the introduction and we will get there. Um, so we came together at the invitation of the mayor and a number of work groups, you know them, data, uh, direct relief and process were put into place and they have been working diligently um, during the, the, the last four months, five months. Uh, it's been, we've been together and it's 
it's hard to figure out how long because we've been working so hard. And we're going to go right now to uh, those board report outs. After those board report outs, what, uh, what, what you will see next uh, are a few comments from Wally and I, and then closing comments from the mayor. I think we are starting, Wally, with Let's go ahead and start with data, if we can. Okay. Uh, and I believe that's going to be Christina Garmendia, if I'm not mistaken. So, Christina, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Wally. Uh, thanks, Sandra. Uh, so the Data and Evaluation Committee has a little bit of a longer update because we have um, a lot of projects that were underway um, related to our charge as the Data and Evaluation Committee. So we're going to give quick um, status updates and um, uh, our glimpse at what the future will hold for these various responsibilities and obligations. Um, and we have a total of five. And um, I'm going to call on my fellow committee members to give um, these many updates, but there, it includes these five items. The um, evaluation framework for the di first direct relief package program. So the overall evaluation strategy, including partnering with external evaluators, uh, an out, report out on the qualitative review board, um, transparency portal, and then uh, kind of internal staffing on data and evaluation internal to the city. So I'm gonna start off uh, with Paul Sorensen to talk us through the framework, evaluation framework. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, everyone. Um, so one of the things that we have been working on as a committee uh, in partnership with uh, the mayor's office staff over the course of the last about a, of the last month or so was really making sure that we gave some initial thought um, to what happens after the board bill was passed, after the funding is allocated, and people start to look at the, the this really important question of whether or not we're making the impact in the community uh, that these funds are intending to make. Um, and so one of the things that we did uh, as a starting point was look at each um, line item allocation, uh, worked with uh, mayor's office staff on defining the intended impact uh, of each of those spending priorities uh, and started from a draft standpoint, because we know this has to be done in close partnership uh, with departments, with city staff, um, define a couple of important measures um, and, and some things we think people should look at moving forward. So this includes um, outcome measures, uh, so what is the long-term uh, intended impact um, of each of these spending priorities on the community? Uh, sometimes that's going to come from data that the city collects, and other times it's going to come from external sources, uh, as well as output measures. Uh, so what are the things that the city is probably counting itself uh, to understand the impact it's having, um, you know, where funds are being spent, who is reached, um, disaggregating that reach by race and geography uh, to understand disparate impact, um, and moving forward from there. So we're really happy as a committee, uh, the work that we are able to do as a starting point with the mayor's office uh, and are, are hopeful um, that that work uh, ends up being picked up and moved forward, um, you know, with city staff and others uh, in the months to come. Thanks, Paul. Next, we're going to move to uh, Dr. Jason Purnell to talk about the overall evaluation strategy and external partners. Thank you, Christina. Um, and we will be sharing this in a written document as well, but just to briefly uh, review, uh, two of our last charges were identifying opportunities to expand data infrastructure in the city and then recommending a system for the independent evaluation of stimulus funded programs, including regular reports to city residents. Um, in the immediate term, at the most basic level, we recommend that there should be theories of change and or logic models developed for all programs funded by stimulus dollars. Um, and this will help to describe both the planned activities and the in intended outputs, which is, uh, for instance, the number of people served, but also the outcomes, uh, which is the change in condition or functioning as a result of the program uh, that results from that funding. All of that will help to feed into a set of evaluation questions, the appropriate metrics and measurement, a system of data collection and data management and analysis, as well as reporting. Um, ideally, uh, there would be resources within city government for strong internal uh, evaluation and, and high quality research, but we understand that in the immediate term, external partnerships are likely to be the most effective and efficient means 
of conducting evaluation uh, related to stimulus funding. So there are a number of institutions, centers, and initiatives that could be engaged. Uh, just some of them, this is not an exhaustive list, would include the Center for Civic Research and Innovation, the Regional Data Alliance, the University of Missouri-St. Louis uh, uh, Community Innovation and Action Center, and then Washington University's uh, Brown School Evaluation Center Institute for Public Health and Social Policy Institute. Uh, we believe that this should build upon existing uh, evaluation and, and uh, data infrastructure work that has happened in the city. And we would recommend that both city stakeholders and regional research data and evaluation experts be convened uh, to provide some immediate uh, recommendations around evaluation um, and also to talk about the long-term uh, data and evaluation infrastructure needed for the city. In addition to that, in, in terms of more long-term data and evaluation activities, uh, we would recommend a chief data officer uh, be considered for the city of St. Louis. Uh, the capacity to do simulation analysis and forecasting, uh, which provides projections of the impact of various hypothetical investments or policy decisions before they're enacted, a cataloging of best practices, and certainly modern interoperable data and information systems. Uh, and we believe that there will be a long-term need uh, to partner with uh, the institutional expertise in the region. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Very good, Jason. Thank you. And that touches on a lot of uh, you know uh, some of our later points too. So um, those you know the evaluation framework, the KPIs, key performance indicators. That was kind of we've started a model um, in, in with city staff, and we'll gladly you know that there'll be the next steps is for them to take take it on and take it to the next level, um, and. Next up, um, I'll give an update about the qualitative review board. So the qualitative review board um, is a group of citizen researchers that were trained in last month um, on qualitative analysis um, because the, in the course of the direct relief package research, we conducted a direct relief survey of nearly 1% of city residents um, and the Jones administration also had um, issued a survey um, uh, called the People's Plan. And in both of those surveys, um, almost 2,000 written comments, so write-in comments, were collected from residents. And, um, and the process for analyzing and creating findings and patterns from those, um, from those comments is, called, is a process called qualitative analysis. And it's very time consuming. Um, and so we convened this group of volunteer researchers uh, to help us read through and process those, uh, those comments. And so we did an initial training session and there's a total of uh, 26 participants of the qualitative review board that went through the training and helped code um, our initial round. Um, and so, and it's a good, it's a pilot. Uh, for you know the process that would be required to really take um, the comments that uh, our residents have taken time and uh, their expertise to share with us and to really uh, begin making it a usable resource for um, city staff to be able to uh, go to that as a resource if they wanted to know what people said about uh, cash assistance or uh, what were some of the uh, essential health needs that people mentioned most? And so that's that's a resource that um, should be that needs to be uh, completely uh, coded for the city to be able to use it on an ongoing basis. Um, and the qualitative review board, like I said, composed of 26 citizen residents, um, processed 236 pages of text. Um, that's how many pages of text that a whole book um, residents have already shared um, this early in the process. Um, and some of the, just to give you a sense of some of their initial findings, um, we asked them to look at what might have been missing from the direct relief package um, based on the community input. And uh, some of the things that just stood out to many of our readers were 
mental health, mental health, mental health. Um, that was mentioned way more than COVID-19 <laughs> um, as a, something that residents need help with um, and need support for. Um, we heard a lot of uh, comments about home repair. Um, and so I was glad to see in the most recent version of the direct relief package that home repair assistance was included, but home repair is mentioned a lot um, by residents. And then of course, crime and public safety um, as, as essential needs. So, and that community residents uh, really wanna see uh, support targeted for people that are left out of existing support structures. Uh, people who haven't been reached by, you know, federal support, uh, previous federal support. So, and and what are ways that the city uniquely can um, help help residents recover? So, that is um, just a sample of some of the insights. Um, the process of uh, this would be an iterative process. There would be many rounds of, of you know bringing, uh, uh, processing the data and analyzing it and summarizing the findings that we didn't get to um, in, this, in this phase. But the idea and the concept of a qualitative review board staffed by citizens, um, whether they're volunteer or paid um, in the future, I think is critical for the city to be able to really take um, advantage of such an engaged citizenry. Um, that are interested, engaged, and want to help the city uh, identify key problems, help identify key solutions and partners. Um, and so this is a, a, a body that needs to continue in some form or fashion. And, uh, but just to note that the city currently doesn't have very much internal capacity uh, or formal roles where um, there's qualitative analysts. Uh, that can take, you know, read pages and pages of citizen input and process it. Um, and so this is an area where we hope the city can bring on additional resources, whether they're, um, whether they're paid or volunteer, um, but ultimately volunteers are a temporary bandage because this is a, a skill set the city needs to be able to really have meaningful community engagement. Um, I'm going to go quickly through some of our initial recommendations for the transparency portal. So the transparency portal is how residents will hear about the, um, the use of the stimulus, stimulus funds and their impact. Um, what the city is required to do, bare minimum, is to produce an online report. Um, what we are recommending is that there's a... Uh, the dashboard, that there's some kind of dashboard that's interactive, that's updated um, more than just once a year, that the recovery plan um, is presented from the perspective of the, the interest of the public. Um, so instead of the recovery plan elements being presented in the form of, of departments that are getting the funding or the programs that are being funded, that it's actually organized by outcome. So uh, you know, some of the goals of the funding are to reduce COVID case rates uh, or uh, to reduce the rates of eviction. So organizing what are the programs that the city is offering or funding through ARPA um, under those goals. And then, um, as mentioned earlier, residents deserve accountability for what money has been spent where did it go? So what was the geographic distribution of spending? Uh, who benefited both the demographics of recipients as well as the names of grantees and contractors? And then regular assessments of impact. Um, so from both outputs, uh, so how many people were served, for example, to outcomes like reduction in eviction rates, hopefully. So, um, but in the future, the transparency portal is in, you know, the very beginning stages of being talked about internally at the city and the city needs to engage key users to help design it. Um, and that includes researchers, journalists and advocacy groups that can really, uh, you know, these are the, the groups of people that will help elevate uh, uh, issues to the public. And so that's, that's 
the uh, group the city needs to continue to engage while they're designing the transparency portal. Um, I'm going to move to uh, ask Chris Prenner to give us the last update on the internal staffing and data and evaluation. Thanks, Christina. And I just want to kind of double down on a lot of what uh, Paul and Jason and Christina have said. Um, you know, I think we see the idea of a chief data officer and building internal capacity as moving a lot of what we've talked about in the last few minutes forward. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge there that this is really a culture shift within the city. Um, we we've talked a lot about compliance over the last couple of months. And when we talk about evaluation, we see that as a fundamentally different task. And so the questions that we would ask from a compliance standpoint are different from the questions we would ask from an evaluation standpoint. Uh, evaluation requires really purposeful pre-planning. So evaluating something like the $500 um, uh, checks that we are hoping get out to the most vulnerable citizens in the city uh, requires a lot of pre-planning before that goes out and not uh, doing it after on an ad hoc basis. And so building that culture change within the city uh, is gonna take both some time and some um, increase in terms of capacity. Uh, we recognize that some of that capacity already exists. Certainly there are people in the Department of Health with uh, quantitative analysis skills. There are certainly people with geospatial analysis skills, uh, but we uh, would love to see that capacity uh, built up even further and brought out to departments that may not have those capabilities in house uh, and see a chief data officer as sort of an evangelist for building out that capacity. Um, I also think it's important just to highlight uh, that it's not just about people and building capacity, but also uh, building those interoperable data systems Jason was speaking to. You know, we have a lot of data that are siloed in different parts of the city's infrastructure, uh, and it's very difficult to draw insights collectively from them because they exist in those silos. And so, again, a chief data officer could be an evangelist for building those systems out, uh, improving analytic capacity in the city, uh, increasing qualitative capacity, and, uh, and really helping not just improve um, the functioning of city government, right, but ideally improving lives for everybody in the city of St. Louis. Thanks, Chris. Um, last, we have a few uh, recommendations for the Capital Projects Committee Citizen Advisory Board that's in the process of being formed. Um, this board should plan on, survey res on surveying residents like um, the SAB did, um, and that they should uh, uh, either contract or bring in capacity to process those survey responses, including the qualitative. Uh, the qualitative review board will be, uh, you know, at, at the ready to, to assist. Um, and, and so we hope them the best in terms of identifying the key uh, citizen-driven needs for infrastructure investment. So that is the data and evaluation update. Thank you very, very much, Christina, and all the members of the data evaluation group. Uh, you all have put in an unbelievable amount of work and have set up uh, what, what could be an incredibly thorough and really kind of a, a model for this kind of work in the future. So really, really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to move on next uh, to the process and planning uh, with the working group. Um, and I'm going to step aside as chair since I'll be speaking as co-chair uh, at the end of the meeting. And the big uh, uh, report out we'd like to hear from the process and planning work, working group is the ongoing work that they've been doing around participatory budgeting. And so for that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Lisa Cagle. Lisa and Shiloh. Thank you. So uh, hi, everybody. We've been working a lot on just trying to define more, more generally what we mean by participatory budgeting. There's a lot of different models out there. There's some that have been done in the city and in the region. So you know, narrowly, uh, so broadly, participatory budgeting is sometimes anything that's a particip participatory project process that has to do with the, the budget. Uh, but narrowly, it's processes that, particip that give participants decision-making power, specifically by voting on their preferred projects and investments, and often, very often, usually, in, 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 in fact, the best practices include the community input on the development of those projects before they're voted on. So when we talk about participatory budgeting, 
we're not just talking about some sort of public input in the budget process, but a robust um, decision making process that is given to residents and participants. So some of the motivations behind participatory budgeting that we just really want to highlight. Um, and I, and I guess I should have said upfront that it's both process and planning and then also some direct relief folks who have been participating in this ongoing like subgroup. So um, the problems that we see are residents are disconnected from the tough choices of public service and that there's a widespread lack of trust in government institutions and even sometimes elected officials. And that PB, I'm going to call it PB because participatory budgeting is hard to say, it's a mouthful. So PB offers a way to re-engage residents to um, educate and inform residents regarding government processes and how residents can influence them. Um, in a PB process, community members can learn and work to find solutions together, which is a step toward a more robust democracy, stronger communities, and building a vision together of what one's neighborhood or city or region could look like. It's also a great way to engage youth. Uh, I have here the residents as young as 12 years old can vote, but actually and the recast process that's being done in St. Louis County um, together with St. Louis City and the Promise Zone, <laughs> residents uh, uh, that are at least 11 years old can vote. So vote, folks who don't have um, the, the enfranchisement to vote in electoral politics can still make their, their, their preferences and you know, their, their interests heard. And PD can spur new innovations as well. So we know that we need a dedicated source of, fun, of public funding to make PD work. Oftentimes, this is at the ward of a neighborhood level. It's a million, two million, three million dollars, but it could be a citywide process too with a much bigger portion of money. Uh, there needs to be an agreed upon process and schedule. This is something we've been outlining what processes and schedules might look like. A staff to mediate the process because it is administratively very time consuming. It's something that requires a lot of time and effort. We need community volunteers to help facilitate the process and specifically we need outreach to the neighborhoods to get people to attend, right? We can set up a whole process, but if people don't know about it and they're not showing up, um, then their voices are still not being heard and that's not participation in the process. So we know that PD has been done and is being done in St. Louis. A lot of folks are familiar with the sixth ward and the 15th ward process. It looks like in the past, we haven't received more information about this. The 27th ward was maybe considering it. I don't think it um, actually ever happened. But in the region, we have a pretty cool process to draw from right now. So RECAST is a, uh, a grant funded program um, with the, uh, the St. Louis County Department of Public Health as the lead agency, but they've been working with the City Department of Public Health and several other uh, organizations as partners and they have about $5 million over five years to specifically target in the Promise Zone. So they had several buckets of, of uh, funding that they were looking at, funding areas. One was mental health, one is peer support, uh, another is violence prevention, another is youth engagement. And all four of those buckets are things that they've uh, used the participatory, participatory budgeting process to sort of outline what residents think are most important. And then they have another bucket of money that they've been using um, to train folks who are engaged in these process that's uh, around trauma-informed care. So they've been doing trainings uh, that, uh, over the past four years with residents who are interested in this, about 80 residents per year. So there's over 300 residents who have been trained in deep civic engagement through this process. That includes training from Alive and Well around trauma-informed processes, training for evaluating different proposals, racial equity training, facilitated leadership training, some trainings that I really wish that I'd had over the years, some really cool trainings that were built into this process um, into their budget as well. Um, and uh, there, again, those 300 residents that have been trained in deep civic engagement, a lot of those are city residents because this is a regional initiative in the Promise Zone. So there's a lot to draw upon here and they're actually, the recast folks, um, I talked to Ebony and Paula uh, a couple weeks ago. They're putting together a, a toolkit um, based upon what they've learned that should be very helpful moving forward. Again, this is a really cool example of this process because while we've done stuff at the ward level in the region, this is the first time that we've done something that's much bigger than the ward level on participatory budgeting. And we have a really cool model to draw from here. 
So a couple of the things that we just want to make sure that folks are understanding about participatory budgeting, there are different kinds of process variants. So the question that people have to answer when we're thinking about the process and the schedule is, do residents have direct decision making power? That is, are they voting directly on projects or are they represented? Um, you know, are there people who are representing them to express preferences and citizen um, and resident um, priorities? So if they are represented, how is that determined? Are they appointed, elected, randomly chosen based upon people who fill out applications? These are all things that have to be answered. Uh, another question is who gets to recommend the initial options or projects, right? So uh, the projects that people vote on either directly or through representation, are those outlined by the, citizen, the citizens themselves, by the residents themselves or by someone else? And who decides which projects get to flesh get to be fleshed out and move toward a vote? Um, preference modeling options that is how do participants express preferences? How many levels of voting are in there? And then um, consensus versus voting. So voting can be done with different rules such as simple majority, approval voting, ranked choice voting. But you might also have a process, particularly if you're having representatives engage in this process of consensus. And if it is a consensus process. You know, how is the debate, negotiation, arbitration scheduled? And I, I think that these process variants are really important because a neighborhood or ward level process versus a citywide or larger process might look very different just for the mechanics and administration of that process as well. So just making sure that people recognize that there are variants, that the, the stuff that you've heard here in St. Louis or other places are particular versions of those variants, but there's some decisions to make as well. Um, I'm happy to share these videos. Um, if you are not familiar with PD, this first one called Real Money, Real Power, Participata Participatory Budgeting is from the Participatory Budgeting Project and just sort of overviews what this looks like. And it focuses on participatory budgeting becoming a part of the budget process. This isn't just a one-off thing. It might start with you know, a certain pot of money that is set aside through art funds or something like that, but eventually it becomes a regular part of the budget process so that citizens continue to be engaged, the residents each year sort of become more knowledgeable and more aware of how government processes and public service processes are working and become more engaged in that. Um, I really wanna go back to that um, 300 uh, residents who've been engaged over the past four years through the recast uh, grant. That is an invaluable resource for, for um, for democracy, all right, for democracy, for robust participatory democracy. And I really hope that whatever process goes forward, whatever citizen engagement goes forward, really takes advantage of those folks who've been trained and who've been really, um, you know, engaging at a deep level on uh, helping uh, translate what people's preferences and, and, and into scopes of work um, into, you know, projects that actually make sense um, on all levels. Um, and I, I really recommend us engaging those folks again and, and, the, and the mayor's office engaging those folks again. So that's sort of the high level overview but we'll, what we've been working on participatory budgeting. We really hope we'd be a little bit further and have some concrete recommendations, but given sort of the political nature of uh, what was happening with the direct relief money, um, we have uh, mostly just been compiling best practices and ready to hand it over to whoever comes next. So thank you again for uh, allowing us to engage in this. And uh, I hope that we can continue engaging as subject matter experts or, or whatever else in the future. So Wally, before we move on, uh, thank you, Lisa, for, for that very thorough um, report out. And I just want, before we go to direct relief, to remind everyone, of the through lines that are move and that that I'm hearing so far, and I just don't want us to miss them, given how much work this group has done on behalf of St. Louis citizens. And the first through line is that engagement, citizen engagement, in the next next aspect of the process, should really really be taken extraordinarily seriously, given what we've seen in this work. Um, and the the other through line is when engaging, inviting citizens in, there has to be a methodology for citizens to know that they have been heard, even if everything that they say won't necessarily get done. 
but they have been heard. So I see you nodding your head, uh, Lisa and, and others. And I just wanted to pull those points out um, in our public discussion here so people understand we paid attention to it as the SAB and we're really offering it as the through line for the next level of work that gets done. Thank you for that, Sandy. Uh, and I will second all of that uh, as powerfully as I can uh, in terms of what we're hoping for and looking for uh, with this process moving forward. Uh, thank you for that, Lisa. I uh, really appreciate that work on participatory budgeting. Hope folks are getting a sense of the amount of energy uh, that people have been putting into this work. Uh, we really, really appreciate that. Uh, so next, uh, I'm going to ask the direct relief group to give a report out. I know that this group hasn't uh, been meeting since you did the final uh, recommendations to the mayor, uh, but I wanted to give uh, you an opportunity to go ahead and share any last lessons. And for that, I will hand it over to Ed Bryant. Thanks, Wally. Um, so as, as, as Sandy mentioned, you know, that there are a lot of through lines here. And so I think a, a, our, our report out on this, um, on this last meeting is, is going to be basically echoing a lot of the things that, you are, that you've already heard from the other, from the other committees and the other subcommittees. But I, will, I, I do want to kind of back up just a little bit and remind folks of the mandate of this subcommittee that was, uh, prior, that was primarily looking to conduct outreach to marginalized communities and institutional stakeholders in order to assess the immediate needs of city residents identify opportunities for impactful interventions and recommend an actionable direct relief framework. The framework that we delivered uh, was primarily uh, uh, focused around six uh, uh, areas, critical health needs, housing assistance, support for unhoused neighbors, uh, economic relief, youth jobs and programming, and expanding internet access, uh, as, as well as looking at the administrative costs to actually implement the, this, these direct relief funds. Um, so the framework that we delivered to the mayor's office and to the administration uh, primarily became the um, the, uh, uh, the 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 mechanism for for, um, for 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 looking at the implementation of over seventy million dollars of direct relief funds. So these direct relief funds were not to be the end all in terms of how the all of the ARPA Act dollars were were were, were, were to be um, um, delivered to city residents, but primarily those those dollars that we that that that, that, that we felt would be the most immediate that, that meet the most immediate needs right now in terms of COVID nineteen relief pack the relief package. Um, so I want to really thank um, um, all of the, uh, the the work group members, which included Sandy Moore, Blake Strode, Molly Metzger, um, 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 Latuana Kenner, Megan Green, Grace Kyung, uh, Patrick Brown, Mike Tallboy, Ari Obenson, um, Amy uh, Waymeyer, Dara Eskridge, uh, Richard Van Glan, and myself. Uh, our and, and thank you for your diligent work to develop this, this framework and the recommendations. It was obviously, it, for me personally, it was it was an, an honor to work with with these um, these 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 diligent and intelligent and, um, and um, uh, amazing uh, people, uh, and very thoughtful in the work that that that, that, that we that was done. In terms of lessons learned, um, you know, I will start off, but I will actually also ask any other um, subcommittee member to, to chime in here. One of the things that we learned was um, that I learned uh, was 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 that there was uh, some tremendous data needs that we had or, or data that we had access to. Uh, you know, I will start off with the 211 data, with the uh, other data sources that we were that we were able to kind of lean into the survey data, that uh, we were able to kind of actually look and see and have direct line of sight into what actual needs were there, and so um, um, and and also understand that that there were uh, opportunities for us to to understand even more data um, uh, data needs in terms of moving forward with evaluation and um, and, and and understanding the impact. So that's my report out. I'd like to uh, open it up to, for, for others to, to share any other data, uh, any other needs uh, or lessons learned rather. Thank you very much, Ed. Anybody else from the Direct Relief Committee uh, wanna, wanna chime in at all? All right. Thank you very much. For, but, yeah, but I, I will, before I before before that, I think one of the things that we are looking and seeing is that we are going to need um, uh, more partnerships, uh, uh, partnerships with community members as well as community organizations moving forward to understand uh, what those needs are as well as the impact moving forward. And so um, we, we, we're just honored to be able to do the work that we did and um, um, and to and to serve. 
I, I think the, um, I served on, on, on direct relief. I think the one thing that I would add is in going forward to uh, not lose this incredibly rich group of folks once implementation is getting started, once uh, the, uh, the mayor and the board of aldermen and the, uh, and the president of the board, once they get this all worked out and get moving, don't lose this rich group of potential implementers. These people know what they are doing. They've looked at the data, they've kept their head down and they are the natural group to work with citizens to get the job done. Cause all we've done is laid out the framework and then you, the, the leaders will okay how that framework or adjust it and okay it, but then the work's got to get done in this work group was amazing in terms of people who know how to get down on the ground with citizens. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, to the direct relief group. Um, and with that, I am going to go ahead and hand it over to my co-chair. Uh, next thing on the agenda is a statement from the co-chairs of the Stimulus Advisory Board. And Sandy, I think you're kicking us off. I am. And so um, can't, can't do enough thank yous and we will continue to do that. Personally can't say enough of how grateful I am to have been included. I, I know we've got extraordinary brilliance in our community and deep compassion, compassion and passion. And I witnessed it with all the folks that we worked with and with the citizens who responded. Reminder, you're hearing it, but you can never hear it enough. Our mandate was to build a community engaged, data-driven decision structure in order to recommend spending priorities for the federal COVID relief stimulus funds coming into the city over the next couple of years. Uh, the, this group, the board is a collection of individuals from across the city and around the region, from across the many sectors and systems in the city of St. Louis. The board members, they represent organizations fo focused on racial equity, housing, healthcare, economic opportunity, community data collection and access, education, opportunities for the abled and disabled and foreign born. Um, the, the SAB in, in includes representatives of funding organizations, service organizations, advocacy organizations, business interests, and more. Uh, we were invited to join, or, or we invited to join rather, the comptroller and the president of the Board of Aldermen. And, and, and it's been a pleasure to work alongside the representatives of the comptroller's office during this whole process, as well as other, uh, 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 several other elected officials who put their shoulder to the wheel. Um, our first assignment was to get recommendations specifically for direct relief. You've heard that, we've done that, and we're very proud that most of that is in board bill too. Um, it was designed to meet the most urgent needs and immediate gaps in support of the people, hardest hit by human uh, uh, and economic ill effects of, of, of the COVID pandemic. In order to achieve this, this the, the SAB surveyed, you've heard it, over 200 citizens, residents about their needs, pulled data and so forth and so on. But then we spent hours, and then we spent hours listening to testimony from citizens on their immediate challenges. We took all of that, analyzed, collected, categorized, summarized, and then formulated what turned out to be uh, the, our $68 million worth of recommendations and funding. And folks, I started off today, I told you at the start of the meeting today that I was missing cues. And one of the ones I missed was, we didn't do this in four months or five months. I guess that's what it felt like. We did it in six weeks. And now that I say it, I don't even know how that happened, but we did it in six weeks. So we hope that that sets a standard of possibility for the next tranches of work that have to be done. It can get done and it can get done fast. At that point, as an advisory board, we could only hope that elected officials of the city who have the power and the responsibility and the authority to appropriate the funds would find the advice useful. We're pleased that and gratified that the direct relief plan became the heart of the mayor's $80 million direct relief proposal, which in turn became the core of the Board of Aldermen's $168 million board bill. I've been around a while. I know that surprises all of you. It's not often that 
an advisory board of citizens is convened to give recommendations to a sitting executive and then see those recommendations turn around and hopefully become law in just a couple of months. That is extraordinary. This is a huge achievement and I'm proud to have been a part of the process. I've been a part of other processes that tried and didn't quite get there. I led civic engagement for St. Louis 2004, many, many years ago. And we tried, but we didn't quite get there. This time we got there. Um, I want to extend a huge thank you to all of the members of this board for the time, the energy, the community outreach that you contributed to this amazing effort. And man, am I glad I got that phone call from our mayor, Sandy, will you, will you work? I also want to expand, extend a very special thank you to the thousands of residents. We've said it before, but we can't say it too much. Um, they just, they went to work, they really went to work. I also want to thank those organizations and individuals who shared sensitive data and statistics. When you start asking people about their food, their availability for food or their need for food, and you start asking people about whether they have permanent housing or if they're couch surfing. These are delicate questions that people answered in one way or another to help us uh, understand what direct relief needed to be. Um, I very much hope that you felt like this time, citizens, your voice was heard and you can see how your input has helped create public policy. So our endeavor was successful in creating a truly impactful spending plan for direct relief and an impactful approach for how to engage as citizen workers and as residents of, the, of this community. Thank you all. And with that, I'll hand it over to my co-chair, Earl Wally. Thank you very much, Sandy. Appreciate that. So the initial direct relief appropriation sought to ensure that right now, our city's residents and especially its youth would have a place to live, food on their table, childcare, mental and physical health care, economic and educational opportunity, and access to the systems they need to succeed. Soon, hopefully, this first wave of direct relief will be flowing out into the city. It was always intended that this first appropriation would be a warm-up act for the fully community-engaged process to follow, which would help recommend spending priorities for the rest of the almost 500 million coming to the city over the next two years. This kind of federal investment in our city has the potential to be transformative and the process for making decisions on how to spend it should reflect that transformative potential. The SAB stood tasked and ready to develop an in-depth community engagement process to give St. Louis residents the opportunity to weigh in on their vision for St. Louis, a vision that these funds can help make a reality. And I believe that for many of us, this was the opportunity to help the city to find its path that drew us to this work. Given current realities, it's clear that as a board, as we are constituted now, we won't get that chance. But this is not the end. There will be a new Citizens Advisory Committee with a majority of members appointed by the Board of Aldermen, in addition to members appointed by the Mayor, the President of the Board of Aldermen, and the Comptroller, who must now take up this task. The residents of the City of St. Louis deserve an open, thorough, community-engaged, data-driven, and transparently reasoned spending plan for the remainder of these federal funds. I believe I speak for everyone on the Stimulus Advisory Board when I say that we remain ready to help make that new approach a reality. St. Louis's potential is at least as great as its problems. And all St. Louis residents, especially those for whom the old way of doing things has not been working, deserve a new approach, new approach to public spending decisions. You've heard from the working groups about the information, the expertise, the experience, the structure, the trained network of volunteers they have prepared to take the next step in community-engaged public spending deliberation. We remain committed to supporting the efforts on behalf of the new Community Advisory Committee to engage authentically with the residents of St. Louis about the next rounds of stimulus spending. And we're committed to this help because the question that faces the city uh, next, with this next round of funding, believe it or not, is even more difficult than the question addressing immediate needs via the direct relief appropriation. Because as I've mentioned, as we contemplate spending hundreds of millions of dollars in federal dollars in our city, the fundamental question, what is our vision for the future of the city of St. Louis? 
how can hundreds of millions of dollars transform our lives in the city? Do we simply develop along the same lines we've developing so, been developing so far? Or do we demand a new path for the city? Do we demand new investments in communities suffering from century of ne neglect, including investments in transportation, housing, education, healthcare, the arts, parks and recreation, and yes, directly in our residents and more? With these resources, we have the opportunity to start down a path of lifting up the next generation so that it does not pay the full price for the mistakes we have made and the history that we have inherited. We, the members of the Stimulus Advisory Board, look forward to that opportunity being realized. Thank you to the Mayor's Office for asking us to serve this city we all love. And thank you to the residents of St. Louis for allowing us for, to work on your behalf and for engaging so enthusiastically with us to share your vision for the city. I, for one, can't wait to see all the good that an open, broad thinking, data driven, citizen engaged process to bring, can bring to our city, our residents, our businesses, our institutions, and our infrastructure. With that, thank you very much. And I will hand it back over to the mayor to close out the meeting. Thank you, Wally, and thank you, Sandy, uh, for being excellent co-chairs. I want to give a heartfelt thanks to all of the Stimulus Advisory Board members. I could not be more impressed, more grateful for the extraordinary work that this body has done over the past three months, or as Sandy said, six weeks. <laughs> you undertook a community input process that brought in comments from nearly 3,000 St. Louis residents, all done within a matter of weeks. You then analyzed all of the comments so that your direct relief recommendations would be data-driven and reflect the needs of, of the St. Louis community. You crafted a thorough direct relief plan, almost all of which was incorporated into the direct relief package and accepted into the current iteration of Board Bill 2 and you thought critically about processes for engaging the public. And most importantly, you did all of this on your own time. Despite the political games holding up our bill, your recommendations backed by data and public support received overwhelming support and my administration is ready to implement them as soon as the Board of Aldermen allows us to move forward on this strong legal footing. And while this process is coming to a close, your work has demonstrated the immense value of community and data-driven advisory boards. That's why we're in the process of standing up the Citizens Advisory Committee made up of two representatives of each alder person and four appointees from each member of ENA. The budget director has already reached out to every alder person, asking them to identify their appointees by Monday, July 19th. And I encourage anyone interested in continuing to serve on this larger 68 person body to reach out to your alder person. The, city, the Citizen Advisory Committee will be tasked with continuing your work and helping us set up priorities for the hundreds of millions of remaining funds. And it's my hope that the expectation, it's my hope and expectation that many of you will continue to serve. They will need your experience, your expertise and your insight. We have a responsibility to seize this once in a generation opportunity to transform our city for the better. And while we have and will continue to remain focused on direct relief, I am committed to funding transformative long-term investments like affordable housing, bus rapid transit and other transit solutions, school renovations, community and recreation centers, and a public safety access point as well as making significant investments into workforce development and college promise programs. I'm deeply grateful for your support through this process. And while this chapter of the Stimulus Advisory Board is coming to a close, I look forward to working with each and every one of you to ensure that we invest these funds equitably in line with the community's priorities, following the law and for maximum transformational impact. Thank you and God bless. And I think that's the close of our meeting. Thank you all for joining me on a Saturday morning. Thank, Thank you, Mayor all Jones. For your participation.
All righty. Have a great Saturday, everybody.